up to uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, and then also, if you can handle this, Genesis chapter 1. And so I want to be in two places. Both are beginnings. Matthew is the beginning of the New Testament. Genesis is the beginning of the Old Testament of the Scripture. And so if you could turn in your copy of the Scripture. If you do need a copy of the Scripture, just kind of look desperate or wave frantically. And there are plenty of extra Bibles in here for us to uh, share them around. I want to make sure that everybody does have a copy of the Scripture. And uh, let me share, while I'm mentioning that, a little bit of a uh, just a pet peeve. Everybody has opinions and pet peeves, don't they? And so they're not doctrine, you know, uh, they're not requirements or anything like that. But something that I think is very important is having and bringing a Bible to church. Uh, it's We live in a day and age, actually, when people don't bring anything to church. They don't bring Bibles to church anymore. And that's not a terrible thing. I told one guy, I said, you know, you just don't take personal notes on your cell phone or on your tablet. And he said, well, I do. And he showed me. He had a great apps and programs and, you know, ways that he could reference his notes and find them and so forth. And so, I mean, he really was with the technology as far as that goes. But there's just nothing like having a Bible that you've read and you've written in and you've got your personal notes in. And once you've studied it, uh, there, in my Bible there are locations, almost like places for me. And I have a lot of different you know, old Bibles that sometimes I'll just open, I'll just go to the places I was when God spoke to me about a certain thing or a decision was made or I learned a truth. And I'm not being weird or anything like that. This is just my personal take or opinion. My Bibles I've spent so much time with, they've become my friends in a way. And you say, Pastor, I knew, I knew there was something wrong with you. Now I'm just talking about, we've just had some times together. Uh, God's spoken to me and we've had just, uh, God's answered, answered prayers and, and uh, God has shown me things in His Word. And when I open up my Bible to that place and I see a note or something there, I, can, I go right back there. And I don't know if you have some places like that in your life. Uh, there is, in our farmhouse in Kansas, out, uh, eight miles uh, north of Bennington, Kansas, in our farmhouse. Uh, they added on part that my granddad built on the original rock house. Upstairs uh, in the big room by the bathroom is the place where I knelt and trusted Jesus as my Savior. And every time I'm in that room, I just remember this is where I got saved. That's a special place for me. It's when I was born again. When I realized that God was not judging uh, God would not judge others for their sin and not judge me and that I was personally accountable to receive Christ as my Savior. And that's the place when I was a child that I received Jesus as my Savior. And it's a special place uh, for me. Uh, there's a place in town, Calvary Baptist Church. The building's gone now. There's a truck parking lot where that church building used to be. And I'll go by that, uh, by that parking lot there and I'll sometimes just park, not when anybody's with me, but when I'm by myself. And I'll just remember some preachers that came through that church and the messages that they preached when I was a kid, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to like 13 years old. And I just remember messages that were preached that impacted my life and affected me my whole life. And, and I'll just, those are just good memories for me. Uh, again, on our farm uh, out in Kansas, there are some places. We have about three miles of river on our farm. And it's a really beautiful place. And we have low ground that's around the, the river land and then then up in the pasture parts there's uh, these beautiful big rocks that have green moss on them and there's kind of sandstone from the flood and then there's a cliff that's about 150 feet high and you can see the rest of the farm from there and uh, when I was a kid I used to just kind of walk all the places of the farm and I would climb down to the bottom of the cliff and I remember sitting there and just I remember surrendering to the ministry at that cliff and just making prom some promises to God and some things that God showed me in that place. And that's a place when I'm home and I can get alone, I like to go back there and just remember uh, just remember what happened there. Uh, in our church in Delray Beach, not our church, but the church that I was assistant pastor at, West Park Baptist Church, when I was first in the ministry, uh, I used to come in in the morning and, and uh, actually my wife and I really got to know each other on the front row, the front pew. We, every day after working the summer day camp, before we were married, we were counselors together and we would... We would kneel and pray uh, for every one of our kids and 
Man, we saw we saw so many people saved that summer. We saw God do so many great things. And when I go there, I remember that front row, and I remember getting to know my wife by praying, by uh, spending time together with the two of us in prayer. And that's a special place for me. And then um, there are some things that God did in my life in that auditorium there. And I remember uh, I remember going back in um, uh, the the right behind the baptistry. There's a door right behind the front of the auditorium there. And uh, I remember being back there uh, when somebody we prayed for for years had come forward. I'd gone back, taken him back, and we'd opened a Bible. And I remember that's where he got saved at, just a special place. And then I remember people that are going to be with the Lord. They used to sit in different places in the auditorium. And I used to go around. I do this here. A lot of you, uh, every one of you have habits. You all sit in almost exactly the same place. So if I'm here by myself, I'll go sit in your seats during the week sometime and pray for you. And so I, I just remember the people I used to pray for in the different places, and, and some of them teenagers where they grew and all those things. They're special spots for me. Well, Bibles are kind of like that for me too. They just they have places in them where God's met with me and God's I've learned truths and things like that. And so I, my recommendation for you is get a good Bible and carry it with you and bring it with you to church. I'm not going, I don't have an opinion about you if you don't do that. But I just, I just, I think it helps the mode and the attitude of the service. Plus, here's another uh, benefit for you. Plus, it won't look like you're texting or something if you're using a cell phone. If you have a Bible, uh, but I know some of y'all do. I've caught some of y'all texting or reading messages and stuff. And if you get bored, the great thing about having a Bible, if the message is terrible, the book's always good, so you can just read the Bible instead of listening to the message. So, <laughs> I mean, it's some of those things. Let me just share with you, but. Um, I'm not old-fashioned. I'm not old enough to be old-fashioned. You know, people say we're an old-fashioned church. We're not really an old-fashioned church. God's not old-fashioned. God is as current as ever anyone could be. Yesterday I was preaching to the teenagers and we were looking at Nebuchadnezzar and what he said about God after God had humbled him. And he said that he is, his dominion is from generation to generation. And, uh, you know... A generation ago, there were young people that thought spiritual things or Bible times or God's ways were outmoded and outdated. And guess where those people are at now? They're in the grave. They're gone. And today there are people that think that God's outmoded and outdated. And guess where they'll be in less than 100 years from now? They'll be gone. And guess who's been there all the time? God has. And so I don't, I don't believe we're old-fashioned. God isn't old-fashioned, but uh, spiritual things and, and God's ways are just always current. You want to be with it. Get with God. Don't get with the culture. Culture is constantly changing, and God is never changing. God's always been there. And so I would just encourage you about that. If you need recommendations on where to get a good Bible, like a one that you could study and that you could... Uh, that, you, that would be just a practical for one for you, let me know, and I'd like to help you with that. I, I just haven't mentioned that in a very long time, have I? I haven't said anything about that. But uh, I'm not against uh, putting the Scripture up on the screen. I'll tell you particularly why we don't put the Scripture on the screen, because it doesn't work right now. <laughs> you need <a> screen. <laughs> That's why we don't use the thing. But I think there's something about the notes in the hymn book. Uh, the last couple of weeks I went to churches, and none of them really used hymn books. And it was too bad because I didn't know the songs they were singing. And I can read music, but they didn't have any music. They only had words. And so really, it was really dead. The singing was just really, really dead. And so I don't think, oh, you can't have words on a screen. And I'm not against that, but I just think there's some value. You ever read the words in this hymn book? They're good. And uh, it's, we need to learn this. If we're going to be part of praise and the Lord, we need to learn how to sing and so forth. So there are some things we do, not because we're old-fashioned, but because I think they make sense. And so that's why we do it. And it may be that everybody else is doing something different, but you know what? They'll they'll switch back eventually and start. They'll discover the same thing again. I've had people that have told me just how how they've discovered the hymns, and they just think they're wonderful. You know, it uh, <laughs> it always cracks me up. People think, well, they've been around a while. You know, they're not really anything new. But uh, if you didn't know them, they're new to you. All right. Did you find Matthew in Genesis? I gave enough time that hopefully we're there. All right. Here we are, Matthew chapter one. And uh, part of what I'm going to preach is part of the message I didn't finish. I think it's like a month ago now, the last time I was preaching in Matthew. And, but I would like to just kind of pick up and tie in some things. And uh, a lot of the message this morning 
uh, is less preachy, and, and it's just it's just that way. It's, there's a lot of doctrine in this passage of the scripture, and a lot of things that if you really grasp and understand the concepts of them, it'll be some of those light bulb moments like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And so there are some truths that are in Matthew chapter 1 that hopefully that will be things that you'll never forget. And uh, so there's some scriptures we'll look at cross-reference that I hope will be a help as well. Here we are, chapter 1, and we are going to look at verse 16 and read down to verse 23. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations, and from the coming of Christ unto the second coming, uh, it doesn't say that there, but it uh, kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it, that 14 generations when you add up, Jesus is probably coming pretty soon. If God's worked every 14 generations, a major world event has happened. The Bible says no man knoweth, but if any man knew, uh, you would, this would be a verse that would uh, give you an idea that Jesus is probably going to come pretty soon. Uh, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If you take notes in your Bible, that's in Isaiah chapter 7 that the virgin birth is prophesied, and that's Isaiah 7 that's being, being quoted in Matthew. Now let's pray, we'll ask the Lord to help us, and then we'll look, uh, we'll make a couple preliminary comments and look at Genesis and some other portions of the Scripture as well. Father, we do need your help this morning, one with our concentration. So many events have happened in our lives in this last week. So many things are on our minds that it is very difficult in some ways for us to just even have focus. But yet... We understand that this day of the week is a day that is the Lord's day. And for Christians, this is a day that we work and labor to celebrate the resurrection and to worship you. And so I pray that you would help us to give you what you deserve today and that the result of what's done would be that because of the word being preached and because of your Holy Spirit working in our lives, that we would know you better and that we would be able to serve you more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we read chapter, uh, we read Matthew in the account of Mary and Joseph. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you have really looked at and examined the relationship of Mary and Joseph, but this is, this is really a tough situation for Joseph and for Mary being used of God for Mary to conceive uh, and to, to be with child before they'd come together. Now, customarily, I think most of us know this, but customarily, they were married. In other words, they had a contract for marriage. Their parents had made an agreement. Joseph was preparing a home for his wife, and they were in that betrothal period of their marriage. And uh, uh, they, and this, is, this, of course, would have been similar to an engagement period uh, in, in our culture today, except with a lot more commitment to it. In other words, Mary was Joseph's wife, the preparations just had to be made, that the deal was done. They were going to be married, but there hadn't been a physical relationship. All the things that were required for that to happen, the, the actual wedding feast and the actual ceremonies that would have had to have happened hadn't happened yet. And now Mary is with child. Uh, that's, that's a problem in our age as well. You know, it's amazing. Uh, it's not amazing, I guess. 
it's ironic how that we actually do live in a culture that teaches that things like having children without marriage aren't a big deal. But it's amazing how much it matters to you, uh, the moral purity of a spouse uh, that you're going to marry. Uh, I, I ask young people this sometimes when they're trying to figure out standards in dating. You know, they'll say, what is okay in dating? Well, the Bible actually pretty simply answers that question. It says, uh, um, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And it's talking about marriage. And it's talking about the word touch means actual touch. And it's good to keep your hands to yourself. And uh, Hebrews chapter 13 says, uh, marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled, but hormoners and adulterers God will judge. So the Bible's actually pretty clear about what's allowed outside of marriage between a man and a woman. And I don't want to get graphic or anything like that here this morning. Uh, but I've I ask oftentimes, and I know you've probably heard this before, I've asked people, well, you know, how many women is it okay for a married man to kiss? You know, well, probably like his mom, his wife, and his daughter, right? I mean, that's pretty much it. But I'm talking about, would it be, if you saw a married man kissing a, a woman who was not his wife, would that be okay? Well, no. But it's, it's, it's strange, isn't it, that people who aren't married, it's okay? And yet, every person who gets married isn't, you know, they don't want to think about the people that they've married having had a physical relationship with someone other than the person they married. In other words, it matters, actually, doesn't it? The physical relationship matters. It always has, and it always will. And a society that tries to tell you that these are just prudish concepts that are, you know, just engendered by moral people or people who have a, you know, that are trying to force their morality on everyone else, Actually, it just doesn't work out very well in the end. You know, there are a lot of people today that live together outside of marriage. And it's so much so that I think it's probably more common for, uh, for people to live together and not be married than it is for people to be married and to live together. And their response is, is a, usually pretty trite. It's usually something like this. Well, marriage is just a piece of paper. You ever heard that before? Well, marriage is just a piece of paper. Well, actually, it's not. Uh, just a piece of paper, unless that's what marriage is. And the truth of the matter is, is if you believe that. If you believe that a piece of paper can begin and end a marriage, and that it doesn't have anything to do with your covenant promise toward the spouse and toward God, you don't believe in the permanence of marriage, then that's all it is. But actually, marriage is much more than that. Marriage is something that is sanctioned by God, that is provided by God, and it matters. And, uh, you know, most of us come into life and... and this marriage thing in our culture, in our society, most of us have entered into it broken. I mean, it's, it's already broken. But we as believers need to be clear thinkers. I would not today uh, speak in condemnation toward anybody who has a past. Everybody has a past. But I want to tell you something. If there's ever going to be a future for anyone else, we better think and we better come up with it, uh, understanding things God's way, because God's right about it. And this is interesting because this is, you say, well, this is the, you know, the, uh, first century culture and this is just the way you know they're thinking no I'm telling you today if a man is marrying a woman he finds out that uh, she is with child uh, and it's, he knows that it could not possibly be his child it, it matters doesn't it and so this is a pretty serious matter actually and I wanted to ask you a question if you're God and you're planning how to give your perfect son is this the circumstance you'd use I'll be honest with you, people today who do not believe in a supernatural God, uh, they are always casting doubt on whether or not this was really a miraculous virgin birth. I'll just tell you something, it was. It was. And it was prophesied in the Old Testament of the Scripture. And I want to see this. And I want to as well to be reminded, a couple weeks ago, when we had looked at Joseph, we had mentioned that Joseph was a good man. He was a good man. And we see in the text and in the context this morning that he was a just man and, and uh, he didn't want to make her a public example. A public example would be to bring her into the town square and say, I had a deal to marry this girl and she's pregnant with a child from another man. And then they, the town would basically put her to death. He had the legal right to do that. And Joseph said, I love her. I don't want her put to death. And he was a just man, and so he didn't want to make her a public example, and he was willing to put her away privily. This is a pretty major, pretty major emotional event, at least for Joseph, but also for Mary, isn't it? 
you imagine being a, a maid, being a young woman who's done nothing wrong, and being given this circumstance, and this is what it appears as though the circumstance is? This is really something. And friend, it is all part of God's perfect plan. God's perfect plan was that a virgin would conceive and that she would uh, bear a son. Let's go back to Genesis uh, chapter 3, and I want to look at something. And ladies, I think you'll appreciate the message today because uh, this is one of these vindicating messages for the ladies in a, in a certain sense. But I want to look at some things about original sin because <coughs> this is what it's all about. This is what the seed of promise has to do with. So in Genesis and chapter 3 in verse 1, the Bible says about the serpent. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Okay, so that is the story or the Bible account of original sin. Where did sin come from? Well, it came from Adam partaking of the fruit. Now, we're going to be back in Genesis, uh, but I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 really quickly. And I want to read something. Uh, that the scripture plainly lays forth. And um, this is Paul's exhortation to Timothy, who is a pastor, uh, probably at, um, well, at the time he's a pastor at Ephesus. And he's giving things that he wants in the church. And uh, he begins by saying that, first of all, he wants uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks to be made for all men. And uh, then in verse 8, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then he goes on to say, and this is where we come into our context, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, and then he goes on to say, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now here's the scripture we want to get to. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Okay, now the scripture plainly states here that there was a difference between what happened in the garden between Adam and Eve. We begin chapter 3 of Genesis by saying, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he comes to the woman and he says, Did God say? Did God say? Now I've heard a lot of messages preached about Eve adding to what God said. You're not supposed to eat it and you're not supposed to touch it. Well, you know, you know, I've, I've heard some, some messages where they say, well, not only did they cast doubt on what God said, but they added to what God said. Well, the fact of the matter is that the Bible doesn't anywhere say that God did not say not to touch the fruit of the tree. And so I think Eve was very accurate in what she said. I believe at least her husband, who had given her the command that God had given him, had said, don't touch that tree. Can you, Ladies, can you relate to this? Has your husband ever been working on something and he works on it? Of course, on your kitchen table. Uh, my wife has a husband who's guilty of this sometimes. And <laughs> okay, I'm not going to story tell him now. I was going to tell you a story about my dad. My mom coming home and finding my dad building an airplane on her, like a full-size airplane on her table. But I'm not going to tell about it, gluing it to her coffee table. But <laughs> I'm telling that story. Uh, but my wife has a husband who occasionally disassembles things and tries to fix things on her kitchen table. One of the things that a lot of times I do, I break cell phone screens pretty frequently. And so I change out my own cell phone screen normally. 
And when I do, the cell phones have little tiny pieces in them, don't they? And so I'll be in the middle of taking my phone apart and have it all in little bitty pieces laid out on the table. And Melissa will come in, and my wife puts things away. I don't put things away. My wife puts things away. Whether she knows where they go or not, they get put away. And so I'll tell her sometimes, you know, I'll say, I'm working on that on the table. Don't touch it. Because there's these microscopic screws. You always have a few extra, but you need some of them. And so you don't want to lose them, so don't put them away. Don't touch it. Okay, so I can see Adam, can't you, in the garden, saying to Eve, now you can eat any tree here. God said we can eat any of this. So uh, help yourself to any tree here in the garden, except for that one. Don't eat from that. Don't touch it. Right? So Eve says, you know, God said we're not supposed to eat of it, and we're not supposed to touch it. And He said that what will happen is if we do, we'll die. And the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. And 1 Timothy chapter 2 says the woman believed him. She was deceived. Now there is a big difference, my friend, between being tricked into something, being deceived into something, and uh, knowing something. And the Bible says Adam, he wasn't deceived. He was in transgression. There's a doctrinal significance here. This is not just in the Bible by accident. It's not, well, this is mentioned this way, and I don't know what it means. It's meaningful the way it's mentioned. You see, the fact of the matter is, is that Eve, Adam came, he found what Eve had done, and Eve said, hey, I ate of the fruit of the tree, it's good. And Adam said, well, then I will too. And the difference between Eve and Adam is, Adam knew what God said, Eve believed what the serpent said. And she was deceived. She was tricked. And so, in all fairness, Eve was innocent in a way that Adam was not. You say, Pastor, what would have happened if Eve had eaten of the fruit of the tree and Adam had refused to? Well, you don't know and I don't know. That's the only answer I have to that question. But I do believe for Adam, there was an unwillingness to be separated from his wife. I believe for Adam, he knew what the consequences would be and he made a willful choice. He knew that what God said was true, that his wife would die and he probably just in rebellion was unwilling to be separated from his wife. He says, she's going to die, I'm dying too. And he ate the fruit. I don't know what his exact thoughts are, but that's what the text lends to us to believe. Do you see it? And so Adam partook of it. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, Adam was not deceived. Uh, by the way, uh, let me just speak in relationships just for a moment. This is why it's important for men to lead. And by the way, men, women don't resent a leader. Women don't resent a leader. There are women who act as though they resent leadership because men won't lead. And they lead not because they want to, but because they feel as though they have to and as though they can't trust leadership. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it seems as though it's more common for men not to be leaders than for men to lead. And I'll tell you what a, a lady wants in a man. She wants a leader. Being, having a leader doesn't mean you don't have intelligence, you don't have a contribution, you don't have a say. It just means that you have somebody that can make decisions. And uh, it's a man's job to do that. And the Bible actually says in the church that it's not right for a woman to teach men in the church. And this is not chauvinism. This is not first century culture that's shining through. It's just the fact that men are not deceived the way that women are deceived. Men just flat do wrong and know they're doing it. I think there are a lot of women that are doing things and they, they, they think it's right. And the difference between them and the men is the men know it's not right and they're just doing it anyway. And there's a big difference in the spirit of that. You know what we need is men who will be what is described in verse 8 of 1 Timothy 2. They lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And they just they, they love God. They're unabashed. They're unashamed. They're going to do right. And they lead in doing right. And that's what God's plan is. That's what God's design is for. And that's the kind of a man that Joseph was. It's the kind of man that Joseph was. And so when... Mary was with child, the Holy Spirit came to Joseph and said, this child that's conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at the promise for that. If you're still in Genesis chapter 3, uh, let's go back to uh, verse 13. Here's the honest truth. Verse 13. And the Lord said, God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled. The word beguiled means to trick or to deceive. The serpent beguiled me and did eat. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then verse 15 and 16 is where we want to come to. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and, that, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, now let's go to the prophecy. Look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now he's speaking to the serpent. He's speaking to the serpent of the woman's seed. And he says that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. And we know, practically speaking, the scripture is indicating that a bruise to the head is a fatal wound. A bruise to the heel is a bruise but a temporary one. And it is a picture of the cross. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, but He rose again. But because Jesus rose again, then sin and death are defeated. And the devil, the Satan, is permanently defeated. He has no more sin, has no more dominion over us because of the finality, because of the bruising of the serpent's head. The story's over as far as the Satan goes. You read the last letter of the Scriptures, the Revelation, and you see what the Satan's end is. He has time right now, walking to on the fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. But the Satan's days are numbered. He is, his, uh, his bruise to his head has happened, and has happened as a result of a woman's seed. But most of the time we read on and we think, well, of course, that's speaking of Jesus, we know. And we know that when Eve had her son Seth, she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she thought that would maybe be the seed, but at least he was the lion of that seed of Christ and so forth. But actually, we don't usually think very much on the biological aspect of it, and that's the reality that the seed does not come from the woman. So what we see here is actually a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. In other words, we know, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, that sin comes from the seed of a man. Because man sinned on purpose and he was in the transgression. And so what we see in the passage of Scripture then is that this is a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And so then we'll go to Isaiah chapter 7, if you will, about uh, uh, two-thirds of the way through your Old Testament. Uh, maybe a little bit past halfway through your Bible, Isaiah chapter 7. And I want to look at the prophecy of the virgin birth. This is, a, this is a great message to preach. We actually preached it last fall when we were uh, preaching uh, prophecies of the Messiah before Christmas time. But this is an amazing message because this King Ahaz, who, uh, who Isaiah has come to, or the Lord speaks to, this King Ahaz is in a lot of trouble right now. He has, he has the kings of Syria that are basically right outside of Jerusalem, right outside of Judah, and they're about to just absolutely annihilate him. And he's got major political problems. He's, they're, they're having a famine, and uh, they're, they're, they're in big, big trouble. And look at what happens in verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said in verse 12, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Here's a guy that has major, major problems. And God says to him, ask for a sign, either a sign in the heavens or a sign on earth. And if I'm King Ahaz and God told me to ask for something, I'd say, make all the Syrians disappear. I mean, wouldn't you? Or, you know, make me, you know, make me invincible or make my armies mighty or give me power to fight the battle or something. And Ahaz said, I'm not going to ask anything of the Lord. I'm not going to tempt God. You talk about a seriously prideful individual. Well, notice this. Verse 13, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And God said, You're going to ask for a sign, I'll give you one. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And God said, I'll give you a sign. The king of Judah and the king of Israel are going to be forsaken by their kings. You're, you're not going to be king anymore. You're going to be dispersed. There's no, no longer going to be a kingdom where you have kings. And I'm going to have a virgin conceived. And so when Herod, the, the puppet king of Judah, was alive at the birth of Jesus Christ, my friend, he was not of the tribe of Judah. And this man Ahaz was eliminated from, the, from being, or his line was eliminated from being a king when the real king of kings, Jesus Christ, was born. Now, there, that passage of Scripture is a very precious one to me. And I, I will not preach it this morning because we're basically out of time. But it is a prophecy of the Scripture where God gives the nature of the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And the time in which it would happen would be when Judah and the kingdoms. You know, Israel was divided. Ten kings in the north and the two kings in the south, the kingdom of Judah. And so it was Israel and Judah, and they were actually enemies of each other after Solomon and Solomon's son Reboam and uh, Jeroboam uh, had split the kingdoms. And so God said, neither of you guys will sit on a throne when the, the, the Christ child shall be born. And here's a guy that could have had his kingdom preserved by just asking God. Isn't that amazing? The pride of a man. And so uh, now we are back in Matthew. I know it's taken a long time to get there, but we've come full circle now. And I just want us to look now at a couple more things. Uh, First of all, in verse 16 of Matthew, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now you've, you'll hear people say, well, you know what, this is not significant that Jesus is the son of Joseph because of the virgin birth. And also it's not significant because Joseph is of the line of Coniah or Jeconiah, who in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 24 through 30, you'll see that God had said to Jeconiah, your, the, your lineage, your line will not sit on the throne of David. You'll never be on the throne of David. And so being the son of Jeconiah or the descendant of Jeconiah made Joseph an illegitimate rightful king. In other words, he was illegitimate to be the rightful king of Judah. You see that? Okay. <laughs> you say, Pastor, what does all this mean? Well, a lot of things. Uh, see, one of the foundational doctrines for a Christian is the virgin birth. If you don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, my friend, you believe in a God who's not supernatural. And your religion is nothing more than a fanciful, you know, it's just a farce. Either Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, it was a supernatural birth, or Jesus was just a man who was actually not even qualified to be king of Israel. It's either or. And so it's important that the scripture indicates the kind of a man that Joseph was and the way that he was used. And it's fascinating, of course, if you trace the line of Mary, that she was in the line of kings. But, of course, if her son had been born uh, of the seed of a man, he'd have been born a sinner. But because he's born of the seed of a woman, he was born without sin. That's the significance of the virgin birth. If Jesus had been born of the seed of a man, he'd have had the sin nature passed on. But because he is passed, see, because, because man willfully sinned. And the sin nature is passed down through men. And so, ladies, here you have your vindication. Oh, you say, you know, no, no, no. Well, listen, you're responsible for the sin nature, and it's actually true. But if you wonder, where did these kids get this? If mom and dad are asking, where did, my, where did my son or where did my daughter pick this up? Well, they got it from dad. That's where they got their sin nature. And anything that's not, or anything perfect about them, they evidently got from mom. And any husband who's honest about that will admit it because it's taught in the Scripture. That's the point of the message today. I hope you know. <laughs> we can go home now, right? Are we almost done? All right. Uh, but really, seriously, the sin nature is passed by the seed of man. You'll never have a child who's born without sin. And people say, well, you know what? I, I don't see, you know, I don't see how a child could need to be saved. I believe that the Bible very plainly teaches that there is an age of accountability when a child can know that they need to be born again. But the reason we know that children need to be saved is because they're born sinners. Because they weren't born of the virgins as Jesus Christ was. And so in verse, uh, now in verse 21, we look again at this prophecy. She shall bring forth a son, uh, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then verse 22, the Bible says, Now all this was done 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so Jesus Christ, my friend, is born of a virgin. Matthew. Matthew is a gospel. Gospel of what? Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Matthew's gospel begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ with the explanation, my friend, that Jesus Christ was the first person to ever be born of a woman who was born without sin. And that brings us to the crux of the message here this morning. Because you and I, my friend, were not born the same way that Jesus Christ was. We were born sinners. And this is why every person who's ever been born has need for a Savior. And the reason that we know that the Savior is Jesus Christ is because He's the one who is the only one who's ever been born without sin. And yet we know that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And why did Jesus die on the cross? He died for sin. Whose sin did Jesus die for? He died for our sin. And he had the right to do so because he was the only person who never sinned. This morning when we were talking with the, I've been teaching in the teen Sunday school class about dealing with injustice. Dealing with the fact that life isn't fair. One of the things that will help you as a believer to deal with injustice is to, to always come to the reality or the uh, real understanding that things aren't fair in life actually. Evil happens to you and oftentimes you're innocent of the evil that happens to you. But one of the things you're not innocent of is the evil that you've done, and that same evil is that which crucified Jesus Christ. In reality, the only person who has ever been born in innocence in the world is Jesus Christ, our Savior. And yet He's the one who died for sin. The greatest injustice that ever happened, the greatest injustice that ever happened, happened at the will of God when He crucified His own Son in my place and in yours. And friend, we cannot help today but to conclude by saying God loves you very much. In order to have His innocent Son who never sinned, who had kept the law, who had fulfilled the law, being the only person to never break the law, but who in His coming actually came to fulfill the law. And Jesus Christ, my friend, died for your sin. And so how can we conclude the message here today? Well, we conclude the message here today by... by realizing that, first of all, either God is a supernatural God or He's not. See, the virgin birth is, is a very, very difficult thing, scientifically, humanly speaking, isn't it? Actually. Is it a difficult thing for a supernatural God? No, not at all. It's actually possible. So, we conclude today by saying either God is supernatural or there is no God. One or the other. Let's be real about it. There are tons of people that go to church and that dress up on Sundays and take themselves to a place where they sing songs about God and they learn, quote, spiritual truths and they don't even believe in a supernatural God. To that I say it's all a farce. It's all for pretend. I, I can't, don't know what the motives of the heart of somebody who doesn't believe in the virgin birth would be. I cannot, I cannot look inside someone's heart. But if I were worshiping in a church and I did not believe in the virgin birth, I promise you I would only be doing it to impress people. I would not be doing it because there was anything real about it in my heart. But because Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, my friend, all of a sudden it gets very real for me. Because I need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. He's the only one who's qualified to die for sin. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And for me personally, there came a time in my life when I actually realized that, yes, I am a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I deserve condemnation. You know, we're afraid today to talk about condemnation. But the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God said that. God said that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. My friend, you cannot have the gift without the condemnation before the gift. And there came a time in my life, it was when I was a child, and I realized that I deserved death because of my sin. I couldn't blame anyone else. I couldn't look to anyone else. I was born a sinner, and I deserved death. And then I had a Savior who was God's perfect Son who died for my sin, and I just received Him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know what the words are, but here are the, here's what you need to say if you never received Jesus as your Savior. God, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sin, and I'm asking you to save me. I want the free gift of eternal life. 
You know it's that simple? That's what the Bible calls being born again, being born of the Spirit, being born of God's Spirit. And it all happened because Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He had the, he had the human pedigree. He came from the line of a father who was a king, but that man wasn't his actual father. He came from the line of a mother who was in the lineage of the king, but, uh, but Jesus Christ was the actual king of kings because he is God. Father, thank you so much for a supernatural Savior, for being a supernatural God. And God, because you're able, you're able to give us Christ who was born of a virgin. God, you're able to also to be the one who takes the death of Christ and allows the substitutionary atonement. That is, that we can pray and receive Christ as our Savior and have our sins placed on His cross and God have His righteousness attributed to us. God, I pray that there's any person here this morning that does know not, not know Jesus as their Savior, that they would see both the simplicity and the necessity of calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. Then, God, I just thank You so much for being a God who is supernatural. A God who not only prophesies from the moment man first sinned of the Messiah, not only prophesied to a rebellious king who would not ask you of anything of the virgin birth and the specifics of Christ's birth, but God, you gave us Emmanuel. You gave us God with us. And God, today we conclude realizing that the very concept of Emmanuel, God with us, is something that ought to be foreign. We have no right to have access to a God whom we've sinned against. And yet, God, because of your great love for us and because of the sacrifice of your Son, that's what we're able to have, and we thank you for it. Before I finish my prayer, I'd like to ask that each would keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed. I would not for anything call out or embarrass anyone here today, but I do not as well want to leave this place without making sure that every person here today knows that Jesus Christ is their Savior. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, you know the virgin birth of Jesus Christ has made it occur to me that there is more to being saved than simply being born into a church or being baptized into a church or being called a Christian, but that receiving Jesus, just as the Bible says, that Jesus was a supernatural Son of God. And my eyes have been opened to the nature of our Savior because of the virgin birth today. I, I, I've never been saved before. I've never actually... I don't know for sure that I've ever been born again, but uh, the Scripture today has opened my eyes to my need for that. Would you just slip your hand up in the privacy, no one looking around. Just slip your hand up, slip it back down. I'll see it. I won't even call you out. But if you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I know that I need to be saved because of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, the second question I want to ask is this. You're here today, and you say, Pastor, you know, today uh, the message wasn't real exciting. But the message today helped me to understand the importance of the virgin birth in a way that I never have before. And now I know something that I can share with people, with lost people, about the nature of my Savior, Jesus. And so pray for me that God will give me the opportunity both to understand this better and to share it with others. God showed me something today and I want it to be used in my life. Would you just slip your hand up? Pastor, pray for me. Yeah, just slip up, slip them right back down. Okay? Fantastic. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to thank God in just a moment and close the prayer. And this morning, I don't think we need to, uh, I think we'll just have our pianist play through a hymn without singing. And if God's spoken in your heart, why don't you just do business with him during the time of invitation. If you need someone to pray with you, Brother Taj is available in the back, and I'm available in the front. and be happy to do that during the invitation time. God, I do ask that you would bless and move in our invitation now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Instead of standing, why don't we just have everyone just remain seated just for a moment uh, so that folks can... can uh, just make permanent with God the things that they've responded to or they've said in their prayers while our pianist plays just through one uh, verse of the invitation. Would you do that, please?